So first, could you tell us a little bit about your background? I am uh, Helen Ling. I'm a neurologist and neuroscientist. I currently work as a senior research associate at University College London Institute of Neurology. And my main research interest is in neurodegenerative diseases, in particular in a condition known as tauopathy, which involves the abnormal accumulation of tau, which is a brain protein. Could you tell us about the background of your recent paper on CTE in soccer players and how this research came about? For many years we know that um, some ex-boxers have a, a brain degenerative pathology known as chronic traumatic encephalopathy, also referred as CTE. And since then, um, studies have shown that the similar and the same pathology is also found in uh, other contact sports athletes such as American footballers and in soldiers exposed to blast, um, blast injury. And uh, some studies examining the brains of contact sports athletes have shown that the key risk factor is repetitive head impacts causing uh, traumatic brain injury uh, which lead to CTE developing. So for our study uh, between the year 1980 and 2010, we identified 14 professional uh, footballers who developed dementia. Retired footballers were followed up regularly in the clinic and uh, eventually six came to post-mortem and the focus of our study is on the neuropathological examination findings of these six uh, post-mortem um, brains. So what were the key findings on this study? Of the 14 retired professional footballers uh, who developed dementia, as I said, six came to post-mortem and all 14 of them uh, had an average uh, playing career of 26 years. They were all skilled headers of the ball and half of them actually uh, played in positions that require frequent heading, including uh, centre forward and centre half positions. And concussion rate was actually quite infrequent, which is an, a known fact among professional footballers. And concussion with loss of consciousness was only reported in six out of 14 of these footballers, uh, limiting to just one episode uh, throughout their playing careers. Of the, um, of the six post-mortem cases that we reported, um, they developed dementia in their 60s and um, they all presented with uh, memory problems, behavioural problems and up to half of them actually also had Parkinsonis Sonian symptoms and also uh, balance and walking difficulties. And um, after the onset of the neurological symptoms, their survival period on average is about seven to eight years. And, and most of them die of advanced dementia. As far as the um, uh, neuropathological examination findings are concerned, of the six retired footballers who came to post-mortem, we found that four out of six had um, the brain pathology of CTE when examined under the microscope. This is the same pathology we find in footballers and in American football players which have been reported in the literature. Now this is in significant excess to the background rate of CTE in the general population in the elderly because in the Queen Square Brain Bank we did a survey and we found that the background rate um, of elderly over the age of 60 uh, of having CTE pathology in the brain is around 12%. Alzheimer's disease pathology is another uh, pathological finding we identify in all six of these uh, post-mortem uh, cases. Um, another interesting finding is fenestration of the septum. Um, 
Septum fenestration was identified in all six of the post-mortem uh, cases and this is significant because uh, only 6% of the general population who did not box were found to have septal fenestration whereas um, some audience might, might be aware of the Corsalis autopsy series of boxes. All 11 professional boxes were found to have fenestration of the septum. Now our finding um, indicates that uh, these footballers were exposed to a prolonged history of head impacts from playing football and this might have led to subclinical traumatic brain injury uh, which is related to the findings of septal fenestration. So what were the key limitations on this study? Well, this clinical pathological series actually uh, started as a surveillance because a psychiatrist who is one of the authors of this paper uh, developed an interest in finding out the potential link between playing football and the later neurological consequences. Uh, after, being, uh, after seeing one patient in the 1980 with dementia who had a history of playing football professionally. Although, although our, uh, our study um, is a small size study, this is actually the first uh, series of professional footballers and uh, with post-mortem findings. So uh, this is very important uh, to, to understand the potential long-term neurological consequence of playing football. In contrast to uh, most of the um, brain bank post-mortem series in CTE in contact sports uh, athletes uh, which rely mainly on retrospective data collection which are subjected to uh, case selection and recall bias. Our study was actually a um, prospective study in terms of um, recruiting consecutive footballers who were presented to the OH Psychiatry Service in Swansea. So they were uh, consecutive footballers who developed uh, dementia over uh, a period of 30 years and uh, they were followed up regularly uh, in the outpatient clinic and um, data such as their playing career, concussion history and clinical data were collected prospectively. So in that sense that um, this methodology actually limits uh, selection and recall bias. As I said, uh, this is a description descriptive study and the main focus is on the um, neuropathological examination findings of the six uh, cases who came to post-mortem. Another limitation is that uh, this study was not um, designed to control for other uh, environmental factors such as uh, head impacts that occurred outside the football fields. For instance, uh, one of the six uh, post-mortem cases actually uh, was an amateur boxer. Although he didn't report any knockouts or concussion, that was a potential risk factor that might have contributed to the later development of CTE. But interestingly, uh, this footballer actually turned out not to have CTE pathology, but had Alzheimer's disease pathology instead. Given these limitations, can you establish whether there is a causative relationship here and are footballers, particularly those heading the ball, at an increased risk of developing CTE? Our study was actually not designed to explain why and how this brain pathology developed in these retired footballers. However, as we know that repetitive head impacts and repetitive traumatic brain injury are the main risk for the later development of CTE. And we also know that professional footballers are exposed to substantial amounts of repetitive head impacts. For instance, heading the ball during drills or at the games, as well as 
other head collisions such as head to head and had to play a collisions that might occur throughout the long playing careers of these um, footballers. Although this study does not provide a causal relationship between uh, playing football and the development of CTE, in view of our findings of this brain pathology in four out of the six retired footballers, I think there is a pressing need to uh, carry out large-scale studies to uh, study the main risk of developing long-term degenerative brain pathology uh, from playing football. And this will justify the implementation of protective strategies and also education of current players as well. So we've recently seen an increase in attention paid to head injury in sport and calls for changes to return to play protocols. Do your recent findings support this? Like in other sports, um, return to play protocols in football uh, take a precautionary approach uh, in that uh, footballers uh, are need to be symptom free after head injury bef before they resume the sports and I think this should stay the same until we have more reliable markers uh, that can tell us the level of traumatic brain injury and neuronal injury after uh, head impacts. What are the risks of heading in children? Do you think we should ban children from heading the ball like in the USA? Obviously our study is not designed to answer this question. However, there is increasing scientific evidence to support that uh, the developing brain is actually more vulnerable to traumatic brain injury. Therefore, banning heading in children will be a protective and preventive strategy which currently still lacks supportive scientific evidence. What are the future research directions following this study and what other research is going on in this area? Um, in our Queen Square Brain Bank survey we found that there's a background uh, prevalence of 12% of CTE in the normal population over the age of 60 with or without neurodegenerative disorders. And another interesting study by the Mayo Clinic uh, Brain Bank has shown that 32% of contact sports athletes has histological evidence of CTE in the brain. That is 21 out of uh, 66 cases uh, that were deemed to, to um, be exposed to contact sports uh, during life. We, do, we currently do not know the incidence of dementia in professional footballers. Finally, what do you see as the key questions to be addressed in regard to head injury in sport in the next five to ten years? There are still many unknowns um, in this field and um, although there are many research studies ongoing, I think that the main focus will be on five aspects. As far as football is concerned, uh, there's a need to look at um, whether there is an increased risk of devel developing dementia in later life, especially for professional footballers. Another aspect is the dose-response relationship of uh, exposure to head impacts. For instance, um, the threshold of the force that is required to uh, initiate the process of CTE in the future and also the frequency and the intervals of uh, head impacts. The, all these are not known and uh, need pressing uh, research studies to find out the answers. Another problem which we uh, touch upon is the potential uh, damage to the D 
developing brain in children and uh, we need to look at the potential risk for exposing children uh, early on to head traumas from playing contact sports. Uh, we also need to investigate reliable markers um, to measure the amount of traumatic brain injury. And lastly, genetic and environmental risk and protective factors are also important things to find out uh, so we can, um, we can implement a protective strategy for individuals who are potentially at risk for developing long-term uh, neurodegenerative damage from playing contact sports.